we are back let's uh, do another example for which we'll determine the molecular formula of a compound based on the mass spectrum and then we'll come up with a few isomers associated with that chemical formula all right so looking at the mass spectrum once more we want to go to the farthest right so the highest masses that the spectrum uh, provides us with and um, there's a few things to notice right here. notice that there is about one two three four different peaks that show up um, all right you want to make sure that you're picking the m plus peak corresponding to the signal that is at least if not the highest equal in height to another peak and out of the four right here notice that this one is up to here this is 25.3 that one down there is only 0.8 five percent and this one is eight percent whereas the one to the left is 3.1 so what this is telling us is that the peak at 76 mass per charge ratio units is the m plus peak uh, the one at 75 is just um, a different fragment altogether and the reason we're not picking 75 is because 75 is lower in percentage than 76. all right so that gives us 76 as the M plus peak, 77 as M plus plus one, and 78 as M plus plus two. And notice the percentages, 25.3, 0 0.85, and 8%. So I'm going to zoom in on that region, and we're going to start playing with it. Now, the fact that the M plus plus two peak is present means that we're going to be dealing with either chlorine, bromine, or sulfur. So we'll, we'll pay attention to that in just a little bit. Uh, but the first thing we want to do is to make sure that the M plus peak is rescaled back to 100%. And since this is out of 25.3, what we're going to do is divide 25.3 by itself and multiply by 100 to rescale it back to 100%. And then what we're going to do to the M plus plus 1 and the M plus plus 2 peaks is literally the same. We'll divide 0.85 or 8.0% by 25.3 and multiply by 100 to give us the proper rescaled percentages for the m plus plus one peak and the m plus plus two peak so we divide a by 25.3 times 100 that gives us 32 and notice here that if you wouldn't have done this rescale the values of the peaks so that m plus is out of 100 percent you may have made a mistake of looking at this thing and saying oh that's a multiple of four so this looks like sulfur when in fact looking at the value of the m plus plus two peak after rescaling this looks more like a chlorine atom all right, so let's start with the M plus plus one peak. Um, this is 3.4, so we divide that by 1.1, and this tells us that there ought to be three carbons. Um, another thing to pay attention to, the M plus peak is an even number. So this is telling us that there can be even number of nitrogens with zero counting as an even number. So in essence, the structure may not need to have nitrogens at all. We'll find out in a little bit. All right, so three carbons, uh, is what we get from the M plus plus one peak. Now the M plus plus two peak, because 32 is very close to 33, which is the percentage that you use for determining the content of chlorine, uh, this is very likely to be a chlorine atom present. Um, so we have three carbons and we have one chlorine atom in the formula. The overall mass is 76 based on the M plus peak. So we're gonna subtract the mass of the three carbons, carbon 12s, and the mass of one chlorine, which is 35. That's the main isotope of chlorine. So what this will give us after subtraction is five. And so the formula looks like C3H5Cl. And um, this is actually okay because for three carbons, you could have up to a total of eight hydrogens. And here you have less than that. So th this looks okay. Uh, in fact, um, as you'll see in a second, we will count the chlorine for the content of hydrogen, but the fact that we're below eight is good. All right, so let's look at the IHT. We have three carbons, place the three carbons in the formula, three times two is six, plus two is eight, which is what we just talked about. And the equivalent number of hydrogens, we have five hydrogens, but we also have a chlorine, and we have to count halogens as if they were hydrogen. So we're gonna say the equivalent number of hydrogens is actually six. All right, so now we have um, eight minus six divided by two, which is ultimately going to equal one. This tells us that the structure must contain either a double bond 
or a ring, not both. It's either or. All right, so we're going to start. I'm going to make some room right here, and we're going to start with the double bonds, um, which means alkenes, right? So let's take a look at the alkenes. Um, <clears throat> Since we have three carbons, that means that we will have to have the carbon-carbon double bond, but then we'll have to have a methyl sticking out of this formula. So this will contain all of the carbons. Now we need to start playing with the chlorines. And one possibility will be to place the chlorine on the opposite end of the alkene. And I could place it in a trans configuration as shown right here. But I could also write it in a cis configuration, right? And these are two separate molecules because the double bond via the pi bond prevents free rotation of the bond. So they are stuck in position and they're technically diastereomers of each other. The other option, of course, will be that instead of placing the chlorine on the carbon of the double bond on the left, will be to place it on the same carbon to which the methyl group is bound. But then there is one more possibility. Instead of placing the chlorine atom and binding it to either of the carbons of the double bond, we could simply bind it to the methyl, which in this case is now a CH2 group. Um, and now we are doing this based completely on the IHD um, suggestion, but just to be sure you can look at any of the structures, let's say this one, you have two hydrogens on this carbon, you have no hydrogens on that one, and you have three on that one, two plus three is five, and that's exactly how many hydrogens you should end up with. You have the correct number of carbons and of course the correct number of chlorines. All right, so that takes care of the alkenes. Let's take a look at the rings now. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that the halogens can only form one bond. And because of that, they cannot be part of the ring structure. They can bind to a ring, but they cannot be part of the ring structure itself. So at most, we can only form a three member ring because there's only three carbons present. So we'll start by drawing that three carbon ring. And then um, the chlorine needs to be attached to one of the corners. It doesn't really matter which one. And um, that's pretty much it for this thing because there's, there's, no, there's no other possibility. It doesn't matter if you put the chlorine on this corner or that corner or that corner, it's still the same molecule because all it will take is for me to rotate this molecule to end up at the different you know positions. Um, so just be careful with that you know the one thing just because you drew the triangle this way that this is stuck in space in that way that's not at all true the molecule is free to rotate on its own axis okay let's do uh, another example and see uh, how we perform with it all right so once more look at the mass spectrum we want to look at the peaks that are highest on the chart and we have a peaks of 75 76 and 77 Notice that 75 is the highest, uh, and luckily for us, that is at 100%. So we don't need to rescale. So we're going to zoom on that. Uh, 75 is the M plus peak, 76 is the M plus plus one peak, and 77 is the M plus plus two peak. Okay, so we're going to use the, uh, first of all, notice that the M plus peak is odd. So this is telling us that there is going to be an odd number of nitrogen. So that's something important to keep in mind. All right, now there is no scaling that we need to do because M plus is already at 100. So we take the values the way they are. 2.2 for M plus one and 4.6 for M plus plus two. So starting with M plus plus one, um, yes, uh, we're gonna have an odd number of nitrogens as mentioned earlier. Uh, we take the M plus plus one value and divide it by 1.1, which tells us the total number of carbons that we're gonna have. So we know that there's gonna have to be one carbon. The M plus plus two peak, which is very close to four, tell us that uh, this is probably a sulfur atom that we have. So 4.6 divided by 4.4 is roughly equal to one. So we know right now that the molecule will contain a total of one, uh, two carbons and a total of one sulfur. Now, based on the original mass of 75, if we subtract the mass of the two carbons, so two times 12, and the mass of the one sulfur, 32 times one, um, and let's put one nitrogen since we know that we have to have at least one. Maybe there's three, maybe there's five. We're about to find out. If we place the one nitrogen with a mass of 14 and subtract all of that from the total, which is the mass at 75, this gives us a value of five for, hy uh, for hydrogen. And at first look, you might say, wait a minute, uh, two carbons, 
Oh, actually, this even works out. So two carbons can take up a value up to six hydrogens. But um, remember that if you do have nitrogen present, technically the content of hydrogen is one less than what you see. All right, but this is the formula, and, and this works out because, you know, you have enough space to accommodate all those hydrogens. So let's go to the um, IHD formula. We have two carbons, plug it into the formula. Two times two is four, plus two is six. Now the equivalent hydrogens, as I was saying, we do have five in the formula, but because there is a nitrogen present, we're gonna subtract one hydrogen from the total. So the equivalent hydrogens is only four. Notice once more that I'm ignoring the sulfur. Uh, so we have six minus four, which is two, divided by two, that's equal to one. So yet again, we're gonna have a double bond or we're gonna have a ring. Now, since there's a few heteroatoms present, this is gonna present um, a number of possibilities that complicates the picture. So let's start with alkenes first, first of all, since we do have two carbons. All right, so one possibility will be to draw the alkene functionality with sulfur bound to it and nitrogen bound to the other carbon in a trans configuration. Um, the thing to keep in mind is that sulfur, because it's in the same group as oxygen, it still has to have two bonds uh, on it. Um, the sulfur connected to the carbon is only one bond, so we need to place a hydrogen on it for it to have two bonds. Nitrogen needs to have three bonds, so uh, having only one connection to that uh, alkene carbon means that we need to put two hydrogens on nitrogen. The second possibility, of course, is to draw them cis to each other. And then the last possibility will be to place both the sulfur and the nitrogen groups on the same carbon of the alkene. And once more, because there's only one connection to sulfur, you need to place one hydrogen. Because there's one connection to nitrogen, you need to put two hydrogens on that nitrogen. All right, but that takes care of the alkenes. Now we need to look at other double bonds that we could form because sure, you can have a carbon-carbon double bond, but the heteroatoms can also form double bonds. And one of them could be a carbon-sulfur bond. And if that's the case, then uh, that only contains one carbon, so we will need to introduce the second carbon right here. And one possibility will be to have the nitrogen bound to that second carbon. And because this nitrogen contains only one bond to carbon, we need to put two hydrogens to ensure that it has three bonds altogether. The sulfur over here, because it's a double bond, it already contains two bonds, so you don't need to put hydrogens, and you better don't put hydrogens on it if you want it to be neutral. Uh, the other possibility, of course, would be to bind the nitrogen directly to um, the carbonyl carbon right here, and basically have the carbon over there now bound to the nitrogen. So I'm kind of doing a little switcheroo between these two elements. Now notice that this nitrogen is now connected to one carbon and to a second carbon. So you only need to put one hydrogen in order for this nitrogen to have a total of three bonds. And the final possibility, of course, is to leave this carbon still attached to the carbonyl, but then take the nitrogen and also bind it to the carbonyl. So we have this um, thioamide um, derivative. Okay, now here's another uh, thing you could do. You could have uh, carbon-nitrogen double bonds. And you still have to have three bonds on nitrogen, so you will have to have a hydrogen bound to that nitrogen. Um, that only accounts for one carbon. So notice here that we have the second carbon, and to that second carbon, I'm attaching the sulfur, which now only has one bond, so you have to have a hydrogen on that sulfur. Alternatively, you could have the sulfur and the carbon trading places. And since the sulfur now has two bonds, you don't have to put a hydrogen on it. Uh, the final possibility is to have both the sulfur and the second carbon bound to the carbonyl carbon. So you end up with sulfur with a hydrogen so that it has two bonds and then the second carbon attached to this thing. All right, now uh, the other possibility you could do is that instead of having the second carbon attaching to the carbon of this double bond, you could have it attaching to the nitrogen to complete the three bonds. And so you could end up with a structure or you could end up with a structure right here, which gives you that trans cis configurations. And then the final alternative is to have the sulfur um, completely bound to the um, saturated carbon right here. So you end up with the structure over there. Now in any of these 
parameters, you end up with five hydrogens on any of them. And you can pick any of the structures. You could pick this one right here and say, OK, you have one hydrogen. There's a second one. This carbon has no hydrogens, but this one has three. Three plus two is five. Bingo. Same thing here. You have two hydrogens on this carbon. You have another two on that carbon, so that's four. And then you have one more on the sulfur, which is five. All right, now, so that brings us to the rings. Because there is a total of four non-hydrogen atoms, you could have four a four-member ring that incorporates the sulfur and the nitrogen. Sulfur now will have two bonds, so you don't need to put hydrogen on it. But the nitrogen will have to have one hydrogen so that you end up with three bonds. So you could place them opposite of each other, or you could place them right next to each other. And that takes care of all the possibilities with a four-member ring. The other option would be to have a three-member ring, in which case you have to have something sticking out of this uh, uh, cyclic structure. So let's say that we put a sulfur as part of the ring. Well, then the nitrogen could be sticking out. And if you only have one bond to nitrogen, you need to put two hydrogens on it to remain neutral. The other possibilities will be to, instead of having the nitrogen outside, you could have the sulfur outside, which means that now the sulfur has to have one hydrogen. And you could place the nitrogen inside um, as NH. Or you could have the nitrogen directly bound to the sulfur. OK. Um, a few other possibilities are uh, keeping the sulfur present in there. But now you have the nitrogen inside the ring. You could have the nitrogen right next to the sulfur, but having a hydrogen bound to it. Or you could have the nitrogen over there in which case you don't have a hydrogen. Um, and then there's one more possibility that I didn't draw right here, which would be to have the nitrogen sticking out, but then you have the sulfur directly attached to the nitrogen. In any case, those are all the examples that you could get from this type of molecules. In the last video, I'm going to show you a quick little rundown of um, how to predict uh, structures when you have more than um, you know, an HD of two. So I'll see you in the next video.